Okay, uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, the work that was done. Usually, when you some, when you have a conference, you go to the conference. But sometimes, when there is a good field site, you go there, and maybe you can pick up some samples and do some studies. So this is exactly what happened uh, here when we were in uh, Santa Fe at the at the meeting for Meteoritic Society in 2017. We just uh, pick up few rocks. And so this was the announcement for 2017. This is the website that uh, was kind of advertising. Look, there is a site that you can actually find the rocks that have been shocked because there are these beautiful shatter cones. And as you can see, maybe on this image, it's uh, well, it's, the shatter cones are almost human size. So they are very large. And of course, everyone went there. And since this site has been known to be impact site for quite a short time, like uh, not more than 20 years. Um, you know, it's like a boom of papers that is coming from this place because uh, no one has ever studied this rock. And so for those who don't know where is Santa Fe is, there is a, this is the city Santa Fe. And so there's this road 475 for anyone who would like to go there. And this is the site where uh, you can find uh, multiple shatter cone formations around this road. And that's where uh, the field trip was. And so we took a bus like this and went through this beautiful red uh, country that uh, there's some kind of like a granitoid that uh, right now we know that they experienced this very large impact. And uh, this was the actual site where we collected the samples. And so in here, you can see two squares, SF01 and SF02, which were the location where we collected the, the, the samples. And uh, we cut them, uh, the, the, the two samples are labeled in here in B and C. So they were like a various size. And we tried to cut a nice cube uh, out of them so we can do some rock magnetic study on them and to see what's going on with the magnetic remnant signature. And uh, so here's uh, another example of this, like a large shatter cone feature that you can see there. And uh, so we had fairly large sample sizes. And so we thought maybe we could like a, cut them into uh, kind of like a very large cube. And then from the cube, we could, will make uh, like a five times five times five, like a 125 samples, right? Uh, but it didn't look like it was the case because as soon as you try to cut it, and you can see it on these images that some of these cubes that we actually uh, were able to cut the cube, I mean, the material is very fractured. And so the shutter cone formation actually result in very tiny fractures that normally you don't see it very well, but uh, once you cut it, uh, you succeed uh, in uh, uh, cutting only a few cubes. So you can see in here, you can see level, there's a layer one and in layer one, we, we were able to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like about 10 cubes, right? Level two, we only got one, two, three, four, five, and so on, because we just wanted to have a like a nice pristine cube. And so all the other cubes uh, were, you know, they kind of disintegrated when we were trying to cut it. Uh, so that's just uh, the nature of the sample that we were dealing with. Uh, then uh, each of these cubes, you just perform this kind of like a classical study that uh, uh, that we, you produce how the magnetic signature is uh, behaving, how the remnant vector is behaving when we are demagnetizing by alternating magnetic field. And so you can see on this net on the left here, you can see how the direction is changing uh, during the demagnetization. And here, this is a Zeiderville plot or like a two, uh, like a, uh, two projections uh, of the of the vector, and uh, this is just an intensity plot. How the intensity is decreasing as a result of uh, uh, alternating demagnetization, and so once we did that, uh, we usually saturated the sample uh, and then did the same experiment that, that we just all demagnetized the sample in the exactly same steps as we did the NRM. We did the same thing with after the pulsing, the 
the sample with three Tesla field and did again the demagnetization. And the reason for that is that uh, we are using this kind of a modified REM method uh, where this way we can, we can basically take a ratio between those two sequences and try to say something about the paleo intensity using this uh, uh, modified REM method. Um, some of you may know this paper. In 2017, we published a paper where we showed that uh, this kind of efficiency, or some people call it like REM method, uh, is uh, proportional to the intensity, hollow intensity at which the sample acquired magnetization, assuming there is just one component. Um, in this paper, we, we show that, uh, yes, this is uh, like a great idea, but uh, there is a constant A, and this constant A is constant for minerals, meaning for magnetite, you have a specific constant, for maghemite, you have specific constant, nickel, iron. So each of the uh, mineral has a specific constant A that you can use to estimate the, the power field of the sample. And, um, the reason for why different <coughs> mineral has a different constant has to do with the demagnetizing field. Because uh, you know when, when, when you have a larger and larger single domain, there's a demagnetizing field, which is actually splitting your, your domain in order to get like a two domain or three domain and so on. Of course, every mineral uh, has a different uh, demagnetizing field, which is doing this job, which means uh, logically that uh, also in order to get this kind of a tendency to get magnetized, it has to be proportional to this constant, which is mineral dependent. And uh, this is uh, the slide that kind of uh, summarize uh, uh, most of the data that we collected and the measurement. So basically in here, what you can see is this ratio, you, remember you saw this NRM demagnetization and SIRM demagnetization. And if you demagnetize the two and multiply it by a constant that, the, that uh, relates to the mineral, which is responsible for the remanence, you get this paleo field uh, prediction as a, as a function of alternating magnetic field. Usually when you have a, like a soft, uh, magnetic carrier, there is a tendency to have an overprint because of the uh, viscous overprint because of the uh, low corrosivity. And that's why often you see these values, these polar field values for the low, uh, for the low field higher, and then they kind of go down. However, what, what is more important that if you do this with the sample that are regularly uh, having a TRM or CRM, they are cooling down in geomagnetic field intensity. That's where the geomagnetic field intensity is. Do you see this blue little panel here? This is the level, this is the 50 microtesla, right? But uh, notice that this, all these sample, they showed a level much lower than uh, we were expecting it. Notice that the, there are colored lines and there are also black lines. So black lines is one sample. Uh, and the colored lines is the another hand sample. We were working basically with two hand specimens that we collected uh, from that site that I showed you on the first the picture. And uh, so what you see here on the right uh, is, uh, is this uh, demagnetization of SIRM, uh, but it's normalized by the maximum. And this is the dem demagnetization uh, behavior during the NRM demagnetization. So you would expect, because NRM is much weaker, that NRM you know, is, uh, is uh, much more noisier during the demagnetization, uh, and as opposed to the saturation magnetization uh, DMAC. Uh, but notice that the, the black sample, the, the samples were nearby. They were not too far away. They were maybe five meter away, but the one hand specimen had much more uh, like a more stable magnetic carriers compared to the other. And as you can see that this demonization plot shows much higher values, both in an NRM and an SIRM uh, window. And uh, what's the carrier? The carrier was important in order to figure out how do I get this follow intensity? Because as I said, we know now that in order to get this prediction through this 
so-called magnetic efficiency or REM method, you need to know the, this constant A. And so for, from this, uh, we, we saw that, th that it shows that there is a magnetite as, as a carrier. So we use a constant for magnetite to, to multiply these values in order to get these power field estimate. And uh, so that's uh, regard. So what was very interesting finding that the prediction of the power intensity is uh, more than order of magnitude lower than you would expect it as the geomagnetic field intensity. And uh, the question is why, right? Then you are kind of thinking maybe uh, what about the directions? And then you look at the directions uh, and this plot is kind of like a, a rotated 90 degree. Uh, so uh, you can see that this is demonetization by 10, by 20 amps per meter and by 50 uh, alternating field, right? Or uh, magnetization. And so you can see that, that the, the stable carriers are very uh, directional uh, dispersed. Uh, that the, the high level of dispersion for, of the neighboring samples indicate that there is something else that must be going on in order to uh, understand the magnetic remnant signature because remember these samples are from one rod right you just have a nice cube you cut it very nicely and so you have a good control in terms of the relative magnetic remnant direction right but look i mean the the, the direction of these magnetization is is changing so uh, so significantly and so uh, we have an observation number one that we have a uh, random magnetic direction and number two that the level of the geomagnetic field intensity from the sample appears to be much lower than we would think that the geomagnetic field uh, was present at that time and so we had this uh, in order to interpret this interpret this uh, there is a uh, i used to work with mario Akuna, sorry about the mistake in his name, who was building magnetometers. And he, uh, when we were, we always wanted to somehow create a magnetic vacuum, but that we wanted to, you know, to get really free magnetic space. And he said, oh, it's, uh, it's very simple. And it was uh, actually a very clever idea. Then you, that you just get the lead bag, not plastic bag, but instead of plastic, you have a lead, lead, right? The heavy, the heavy material that you use for shielding radiation. However, in this case, you take advantage that the lead becomes superconducting when you when you drop it to temperature like less than about nine Kelvin. And so once you have this uh, uh, superconducting, then when you at this low temperature, when you inflate it inside this lead bag, you have a very nice magnetic vacuum because the lead is shielding all the magnetic field from outside. And so for our interpretation, we were thinking, can this occur in nature? And so the idea in here was that uh, we have this explosion uh, during the impact. And uh, of course, explosion creates a lot of ionization, the ionized air, ionized the ground. And uh, as, it, as, it, as it inflates, uh, the, the plasma, uh, like a ball inflates, of course, there is a high electric conductivity along the surface, and this creates this magnetic vacuum similarly like, uh, like you would get magnetic vacuum in this inflated superconducting bag. And so once it gets uh, inflates, uh, this, this plasma spreading is faster than shock wave, which is basically destabilizing the, the magnetic, uh, magnetic grains. Uh, by this uh, by this quick pressure wave that kind of uh, goes through each of the magnetic carrier in the rod. And so at the time when you destabilize these magnetic carriers, you are not in the ambient field, but you are in this shielded space or, uh, by this plasma. And of course, the question is, uh, you probably you have a two different uh, plasma. One is the hemisphere or ionized uh, uh, hemisphere, which is in the air. And the other one is uh, down in a rock, which uh, probably, uh, it, which may have a different property than the one uh, on top. And since we wanted to have some kind of a data to show that the, the, su such a thing is really occurring in nature, we made a, a simple experiment. 
and uh, we made experiment with uh, liquid nitrogen and uh, I will try to explain it in this in this part. Uh, so what you see here on this uh, diagram is that you have a styrofoam cup like if you drink coffee you are familiar with those and of course you can also get liquid nitrogen that you you can fill this uh, cup with the liquid nitrogen however at the bottom you can buy today fairly cheaply, like a high temperature superconductor, which is a superconductor that becomes very conducting at the temperature, usually uh, around 120 Kelvin or, or so. This, this uh, specific superconductor had the 120 Kelvin, I think the, the critical temperature. So once you, uh, once you put the liquid nitrogen and submerge this plate, superconducting plate in it, it becomes suddenly superconducting. And this is what uh, is, this experiment is showing, that normally you have some, uh, some ambient field level that we normalize to zero. But once you put the liquid nitrogen in, you can see that there is always uh, lowering, uh, the, the, the magnetic field is always going to the negative side, meaning that it's trying to, um, to minimize the, the, the ambient field which is there uh, at the moment. And so these are like a four experiments that uh, were done uh, with this simple setup where we just had a magnetometer underneath this plate, which became superconducting. And every time when it became superconducting, we could show the lowering uh, the magnetic, the ambient magnetic field by the level on the order of like a, a tens to hundred of nanotesla. Uh, and so this uh, created uh, like a our, like a new hypothesis, hypothesis that during the impact, there is a plasma sphere, which allows you to get this like a so-called like a magnetic vacuum in which when you, when you have any kind of a destabilization of your magnetic carriers, you, you acquire magnetization, which is much less because you are acquiring the magnetization in the magnetic vacuum. And this, uh, finish my talks is just to thank you to a lot of people who were helping with this project and uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thanks very much, Gunter. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that talk? Yeah, again, I still haven't figured out how to stick my hand up, so I'm sure I'll find that button in a little while. Gunter, that's a really nice talk. Thanks very much. Um, just a quick question, and it might be a bit of a, a silly question, but did, did you actually do any petrography on, on the sample? Um, obviously, you've got quite a big dispersion in your vector and also in your coercivity spectra. I mean, is it, w w was there lithological variation across the sample, and you might be looking at different inclusions within the sample that could give you that same spread? Uh, I, if I try to restate your question, your question was if we did some like a microscopy uh, observation, and we did uh, microscopy observation where we show where we saw uh, the magnetite carriers as well as there were some hematite carriers. But uh, uh, for from the magnetic point of view, it appeared that the that the, it is, is the magnetite that, that is the carrier of the remnants for this rock. And, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Uh, can you maybe restate the question a little bit? Because I, uh, I, I, maybe I didn't get it. I suppose my question is, is that sample lithologically heterogeneous and could that heterogeneity be generating some of your, uh, you know, some of the spread in data that you're seeing? Because your coercivity, your, your demagnetization curves pretty much show two populations of, of Oh, right, right. And the, the, the reason for that, I thought I mentioned it, that, that there are two different hand specimens. And one hand specimen was taken uh, like uh, five, six meters away from the other. And mm -hmm. therefore, that one they, within that specimen, they all show like a similar correlativity spectrum. But uh, the two samples are very different. Or they both show very low level of magnetization. Like a more than order of magnitude than you would expect for the uh, magnet when magnetized in geomagnetic field. Mm. Okay. Oh, we've got number one more quick question if there is one. 
Hi, Gunter. Um, uh, just wondering how how long do you expect this plasma to exist for, and how how does that compare to the time scale of you know the samples being heated and pressurized and cooling and decompressing in the shot work? Well, um, uh, right now it's uh, we are. Uh, the, usually, the, when you have the plasma, the, I, I expect that the plasma inflation is happening faster than uh, speed of the shock wave, which is usually uh, cannot be faster than, uh, well, it's on the order of like a 10, 20 kilometer per second. It's usually when, because that's the impact speed of the meteorite, basically the shock wave that goes in. However, however the plasma is more like a suddenly ionization. Um, and uh, I, I don't have, uh, it's more, uh, in this case, it's more like a speculation that I'm assuming that the, the, this plasma wave is spreading faster than the shock wave. And because of that, you create the, the much lower magnetic environment. And as the shock wave is basically uh, putting the, the, the domains like into more like a superconducting state because you have a sudden like a shock wave that goes through the lattice and i would think that you basically screw up all these anisotropies at that time and then you once you the shock wave is gone then the magnetic grains is try, trying to find the best direction however because there is this plasma sphere at that time it just finds much lower field so how, how long does the plasma last for then? How, how long is the shielding effect? How long does the shield exist? Is it seconds or minutes or hours? Or? That, would, that would be probably dependent on the size of the impact. Uh, I would think that the, the bigger the impact, the longer the, the lasting. There was a work done on uh, similar issues by David Crawford, which was published, uh, I think, last year, that uh, where he was showing how uh, was trying to uh, model the plasma which is created during the impact. 